So welcome to the talk. Uh, this is actually a talk that I wanted to give for for quite some time in this interdisciplinary uh, seminar back when I, I was a PhD student. Um, uh, but finally, I I've, I put it together and I'm able to to give it now. So uh, my general idea for this talk is to to combine some of the more recent uh, research uh, results that that uh, we we obtained to with some basic uh, features about uh, optics and CIS. So I realized over the years that there's while optics is is fairly simple, it there are a lot of misunderstandings uh, out there, uh, particularly between the disciplines. So I just uh, would like to lay out a few of the, the basic principles again and uh, try to bring some clarification. Hopefully this is uh, pretty old stuff for most of you, but uh, I'm optimistic that uh, everybody will maybe learn a little bit uh, just to bring everybody on, on the same level again. So the motivation is really, Optics is super complex, but in many situations, it can be treated very simple. Uh, however, that leads to the fact that there's uh, many misunderstandings. So we will go over some of the, the basic knowledge on, on light, on the, the common pitfalls that people are tricked by, and also some uh, part of uh, what we are working on at the moment. Uh, maybe a full-on disclaimer first. Uh, optics is full of confusing and ambiguous terminology and there's only one solution to it uh, get used to it and stay consistent within your own work so uh, you will see the same word in optics being used with different meanings and you will see different words being used for the same quantity uh, this is due to the the history of optics stemming partially from astrophysics from ocean optics from various different uh, regions of science so it's uh, very important uh, that you are aware of this and uh, yeah, find a way to deal with it and not to get confused. So let's start very basic. Light is an electromagnetic uh, wave. And typically we talk about visible light, which is about a visible uh, wavelength range of 380 to 780 nanometers. Uh, as with all these light wavelength bands, these, these borders are not clearly defined and they are uh, changing depending who you ask and, and whatever. Um, metrologists, for example, refer to sunlight mostly as shortwave radiation, uh, which they typically talk to uh, something being between 200 and 2000 nanometers or 200 to 2500 nanometers. Um, physicists like me always have a, a little bit of a problem with this term radiation as a, a classical physicist when he talks about radiation really talks about maybe gamma rays, X-rays and, and some nuclear fission or whatever products. So then we also have obviously the infrared, which comes in many different names and slight variants, like the long wave thermal terrestrial radiation, which is in, in the red end of the spectrum. And the visible is just what a human can see. We are working a lot uh, with plankton, so, so algae, uh, and they are basically plants. And that's why there is another definition of this, which is fairly close to visible, but it's referred to as photosynthetically active radiation or short PAR, which is commonly defined as 400 to 700 nanometers. But one also needs to be careful here that not each study uses the same boundaries, even for PAR. Uh, we will go a little bit more specific into that later. The sunlight is obviously coming from the sun. So what you see here in, in the yellow, that's what you uh, would calculate based on on the idea on an ideal sun what is coming out of the sun the the reality is, is slightly different uh that's the orange curve that's what we measure outside in space uh as the sun spectrum and then comes our atmosphere and you can see it is heavily reducing uh the transmittance or the the, the sun incidence on our our planet but the highest uh transmission is really in in this visible height range so that's kind of the standard to understand these uh, wavelength uh, differences. And this, of course, impacts also on the different kind of sensors we are using. And uh, as in ocean optics, a lot is defined about sensing uh, quantities. Uh, I want to go about the sensors first. So in meteorology, we typically use some sort of thermopile per parameters uh, and they are typically in the wavelength range of 200 to 2000 nanometers so that's for example what the polar stern incoming uh, uh, radiation sensor is is using 
There's cheaper versions of those which are based on silicon cell uh, photocells, and they are typically just in the broadband range of 400 to 1000 nanometers. So they are uh, slightly different in wavelength range, but sometimes the calibration is adopted to match these uh, meteorological sensors. Then what uh, in biology we deal a lot with is PAR sensors, and they strictly focus on uh, 400 to 700 nanometers. But they have a particular thing because they are interested in, in quanta or the number of photons. Uh, and photons, the energy obviously depends on wavelengths. So they have a filter inside to, to account for this uh, wavelength differences in photon energy so that these sensors are actually counting photons straight away. Um, the more complex sensors are obviously the, the spectral sensors that give you a full spectrum. And many of you probably know these uh, TRIOS sensors that we are using heavily. They are just working in 320 to 950 nanometers, which is much less than, for example, these thermopile parameters. But on the other hand, that's the wide range of uh, covering everything that we see and also almost everything that gets transmitted through the ice. So that's why we like to use them. They come in different four optics. Uh, you see there is a radiance sensor, an irradiance sensor, and a scalar irradiance sensor. We come later on to the world that. And then there is some more advanced uh, spectral images, like, uh, for example, the ASD field spec that is uh, measuring uh, from 350 to 2,500 nanometers, which is an instrument that is very typically used for albedo measurements. Um, so this is kind of the range of sensors uh, that we are using. So let's now dive in a little bit more into the, the geometric uh, definitions of, of light. And to all biologists, please bear with me. There is a few equations and stuff coming up, but I try to explain everything super simple. And it's, But it's very important to understand these differences here, because uh, if you don't understand these differences, there are huge errors between them. So we start off with uh, the main basis, and that is what we physicists call the radiance distribution, and that is just the intensity of light uh, coming from different angles. In these plots, you see here, for example, a all sky camera, a radiance camera image. You see here the radiance from the sun is coming very strongly, and then you see a distribution over the sky. This is the same picture from underneath the water. So it basically describes in which direction you have how much. Uh, light coming from. Often in simplifications, we are dealing with something that we call the isotropic radiance distribution. And that means that the light intensity is independent of the direction. So this is mathematically a very good concept because it makes things easy. But we need to be clear that this is actually in reality almost never met. Because this means that you cannot determine whether where it's up or down or sideways. It's the same light intensity from all directions. That's basically what you experience in a whiteout. But already when you are a diver underneath the ice, you see something white above you and something blue below you. So that is obviously not an isotropic radiance distribution, but still we use it a lot for mathematical ease. So from this radiance distribution, all these definitions of irradiance are derived. So all the, the irradiance that we are talking of, they are somehow integrals of radiance. And you don't need to look uh, in detail into this uh, equation, but in principle, under an isotropic case, the basic downward planar irradiance uh, is given uh, by a multiplication of the radiance in one direction with factor of pi. And one important thing that is also to be noted here is that we have a cosine waiting here. We will come, come back to that later. We do distinguish between downwelling and upwelling uh, planar irradiance. So just looking at the photons traveling downwards through a plane or upwards through a plane. And if we have these two things, we can actually derive something which is called net planar irradiance, and that is the downwelling irradiance minus the upwelling irradiance and really describes the amount of energy that is crossing a plane. So now we've talked a lot about irradiances and uh, they have a very peculiar thing about them. And the thing is that energy conservation seems to be violated for uh, downwelling or planar irradiances. Like you can suddenly have random increases in irradiances due to, for example, changing scattering properties. 
Um, and energy conservation as such is obviously always true, but it's only evident if you look at net planar irradiance. Uh, and in all the other irradiances, you can have effects that are somehow surprising to you and that, that you think are might be violating the conservation of energy, but actually they don't. So let's look a bit uh, further. I said that we have here this uh, cosine weighting of the of the radiances in the planar uh, irradiance, no matter whether it's down or upwelling irradiance. So that basically means that depending from which angle a ray is an, a light ray is hitting our plane, uh, it's weighted differently. So straight rays are weighted fully, and everything that comes at a grazing angle is not counted not not so much. And this is important because that, of course, represents the energy going uh, through a plane. Now, often in biology, it's more important to actually know the number of photons, for example, hitting a cell, so a circular thing. And that's why, uh, particularly in biology, we did a lot with scalar irradiance. And you see, we are dropping the cosine uh, weighting in here. So every photon is suddenly equal. So they all, no matter where they are coming from, they, uh, uh, they count the same for our measurement. And this in principle is also defined for downwelling scalar and upwelling scalar. But there's another more complicated or step is that we also use sensors that measure both these irradiances, the scalar upwelling and the scalar downwelling at the same time. And this is often also referred as four pi uh, scalar irradiance. And why you can easily see because the planar irradiance is given by pi multiplied the radiance, and then the uh, total scalar irradiance is given by a factor of four more. Now there is a severe backfall uh, with uh, with all these things. All these quantities have exactly the same unit in the SI system. They are all watts per square meter, and there is no clear sign on the unit which of these you are using and this is a thing that is often lost when you for example transfer between uh, physical light measurements and biological uh, incubations or so and you see that you might be off by a factor of four just by not caring about which quantities you are actually comparing here at the moment so it might look very technical but if you don't understand that you can easily run into into big problems when you uh, start comparing your light measurements. Looking a bit uh, more into this interconnection between uh, physics and, 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 and biology, how they, they treat this. As I said, in, in biology, as we're interested in photosynthesis, we're mostly looking at this four pi uh, irradiance because it just counts the number of photons hitting a cell. While in physics, we are always interested in an energy across a plane, and that's that's the main in difference. For example, that's also why in biology, sometimes a unit called Einstein is used, and that is just the number of photons in moles, which is a slightly fancy uh, unit. Now, here you see that also these are both biological PAR sensors, and the left one that is uh, a normal planar irradiance sensor, while on the right side you have a four pi sensor. You see that are these bulb shaped uh, sensors that are trying to measure light from all directions independently. And many of these sensors, as I said, in physics, we strictly use uh, watts per square meter, while in biology you often deal with Einstein's or micromoles per, per square meter uh, and second. So, there are some rough conversion uh, factors between these, these two units, uh, but you need to be careful because these conversion factors depend on the spectral shape of the light that you're measuring. And uh, strictly, you can only compute uh, these uh, micromoles photons if you uh, from a physical measurement if you have a spectral distribution coming with it. But for most cases under natural uh, light, we get reasonably well with, with this factor of 4.7. So let's look a little bit more into the 
the governing factors of radiative transfer in CS, and as I said, the source is here always the sun. We have some direct radiation coming from the sun, which might get reflected specularly at, at the surface. There's some diffuse reflection at the surface. And as you all know, we have a lot of clouds in the Arctic. So there is actually a lot of scattering back and forth, all not only within the ice, but also between the cloud layers and the, the ice, and that changes a lot. Inside the ice, we are really looking at the two processes of absorption and scattering that then determine how much uh, light gets uh, transmitted uh, through the ice. And uh, again, we go through some the, the sum of the basic equations. Well, we don't go into quantum electrodynamics, which is really the basic equations for all of this. We also don't go into the Maxwell equations, which is kind of the easy version of the, the quantum electrodynamics. <laughs> Uh, for optics, luckily, we have a, a, a fairly easy uh, equation, which is called the radiative transfer equation, which basically is a, a diffusive equation describing the, the vertical change in radiance uh, given by terms of absorption, scattering and light sources. This looks complicated and this is complicated. So solving this equation is an entire field of science of radiative transfer and it's it's not easily uh, understood. So we will look a little bit into the more easy solutions. So what are ways to solution here? There's obviously, as with all equations, you can find some analytical solutions. You can either do some numerical solutions, for example, using the discrete ordinance method. Uh, we can do photon tracing, a so-called Monte Carlo modeling to really trace individual photons through a medium. And if you want to learn more about all this uh, radiative transfer, and uh, it's a very good compendium about uh, all radiative transfer properties and what is irradiance, what is radiance. I really want to highlight here for you this, this Ocean Optics uh, web book. Uh, it's a website that I often go back to and that has all the details and also at different levels of, of complexity. It's derived from an old book of Light and Water by Kurt Mobley, and it's a really good resource uh, for, for anybody who has any question about light. So let's go to the, to the most common solution of this, this complex beast. And as you know, we physicists like to make things easy. So in this, in this first term, we just decide, okay, we're just looking at normal incidence. So lights, lights rays hitting uh, the ice, for example, straight on, on a straight angle, and that there is radial symmetry. So there is not, for example, a sun pointed in a certain direction. Then we leave the absorption term because we kind of need that. Uh, we assume that there is no scattering at all. And we also assume that there is no sources to make this be somehow easier. And this leads us to this uh, much easier um, differential equation. And maybe you remember from your studies that an easy solution to this exponent uh, to this is an exponential decay law that the, the radiance at a certain depth is given by the radiance at the at the, the surface multiplied by the exponential of an extinction coefficient and the geometric uh, thickness. So you see, this is very close to what many of you know for parametrizations of, of light in CS, uh, but we need to be recollect here that this equation is actually only true in the case for no scattering or only conservative scattering and no light sources so far away uh, from boundaries. And uh, this is an important thing to keep in mind so that you don't run into issues when, when using exponential models. Another thing, where do these exponential uh, models come from? And this uh, Dependency of, of light on the thickness of, of a medium was actually discovered by, by Bouguer in, in 1729 and then Lambert in, in 1760 also uh, developed further on, on the mathematical concepts because Bouguer didn't really have the, the differential uh, equation mathematics at that time to, to describe it. Um, there is a law that is often uh, cited uh, when doing exponential models, uh, which is related to Bayer. And uh, yeah, he published something about 123 years later, but actually his work does not relate to the thickness of a medium uh, and the light absorption, but only to the concentration of an absorbing dye in a medium. So um, I really want to point this out that 
um, if you use the term Bayer's law for, for describing an exponential model in, in sea ice, this is as accurate as saying that Thomas Compton has di discovered the transpolar drift. I mean, Thomas has certainly worked on, on drifting sea ice, and, uh, but he's definitely 130 years after Nansen and also worked on slightly different things. So using the term Bayer's law in this case is really uh, not the case. However, there's some rescue. Uh, there is some place for beer, not for beer, but beer in CS optics. And we have uh, a lot of contribution from scattering and absorption. And for people, it's very easy to remember. If you look at the beer, you actually have two regimes. You have an absorptive regime down here in the beer where you see the color. And then you have the foam on the beer. And, and that is where scattering is, is most prominent. And very similar uh, to sea ice here, uh, the scattering causes this white color of, of the beer foam. So let's go into a bit back into a normal uh, absorption. Typically, you would have a, a light source, something absorbing and a detection. And then, as I said, uh, the lambert boogie uh, exponential law describes you how this relates to, to the thickness. And the Beer's law would tell you how uh, a concentration of an absorbent dye in this uh, for example, the concentration of beer in a solution uh, affects your light transmission. Important here is also this is in a plane parallel geometry and there's no scattering around. Absorption is what leads to the color of water. So we have here a, an absorption minimum around 450 nanometers, uh, both for ice and water. And this strong wavelength de dependency of the, the uh, absorption makes that water is blue or generally that we see color. And it's the same reason why plants look, click, look green. So because they have a strongly uh, wavelength dependent absorption. Let's go to scattering. So we've thrown away all this, this complicated term uh, about scattering, and this is really the, the, the complicated part of, of radiative transfer. If we didn't have scattering, radiative transfer would be easy. Um, scattering de describes all interactions of photons with matter that change the impulse of the photon, so either the direction or the energy of the photon. And it's important here to, to remember that, that sea ice is, is a strong scatterer and that makes uh, light calculations nastily difficult. So let's look a bit into scattering. As we said already, the wavelength dependency is weak. That's why the ice on the surface looks white. Uh, scattering in ice is strongly forward peaked, which makes mostly uh, computations very complicated. And the causes for the, the scattering is mostly air bubbles, uh, crystal boundaries, solids, et, et cetera. So there is uh, so far no really consistent method for scattering measurements within the ice, uh, but we are, we are working on it. So this is the basics of radiative transfer. Let's now dive back into uh, the quantities of, of measurements. So we discussed already we have this uh, measurements of irradiance and radiance. And with that, we are, we are able to observe apparent optical properties. That's like the albedo of the ice, the transmittance of the ice, but also the bulk extinction coefficient. Apparent optical properties, that's what we describe as not really material properties, but they are ratios or functions of observed irradiances. So for example, for albedo, that is the ratio of the reflected irradiance derived by the, the incoming radiance. This is in stark contrast to the, to the inherent optical properties, uh, which for example is the absorption coefficient or the scattering coefficient or the scattering phase function. Apparent optical properties are really a trick. As I said, they are not material properties, but they can depend on material properties. They obviously depend on snow and ice thickness. They depend on bubble content, solid content, impurities, um, liquid water content, all these things. Uh, but there's also measurement properties that affect these apparent optical properties. Like, for example, if you have cloud cover or what time of day it is, what the incoming light field is, what geometry you're measuring in, all this is influencing what albedo you measure. So you should never treat an albedo or something really truly as a, as a material property. 
As I said, inherent optical properties, this is true uh, material properties, but we have one problem and the problem is that we uh, don't have a good link between uh, the physical properties like ice age and type and it's their inherent optical properties. We have a few structural optical models, but they are not very far advanced. Um, we have a lot of measurements on apparent optical properties, like for albedo and transmittance. And we know that once we know the inherent optical properties, we are really good in, in putting it into a radiative transfer model and doing that calculation. So what we are working on at the moment is to use novel observation technologies to, to put better constraints on these inherent optical properties so uh, that will help us to actually later on in climate models or any kind of uh, light parameterizations to constrain better the link between actual physical properties of the ice and the apparent optical properties determining the energy balance. It is uh, very important that uh, this full structural optical treatment is currently uh, only done in very sophisticated models, like for example, ice pack in a few uh, configurations. Um, but there's also a disadvantage to that because obviously uh, then you just move your uncertainties from the apparent optical properties to the IOPs. So we need a very good grasp on, on how to describe these IOPs. And to get there, uh, in the last uh, years I've been working uh, together also with the people from, from Takovic at, at Laval uh, to improve our understanding about inherent optical properties of CIS. So one tool that we developed is the CIS endoscope uh, for direct uh, scattering measurements inside the ice. And what we basically do here is we, we shoot a one watt uh, red laser into the ice and then look at the, the decay of this, this glow that you kind of see. And from that, we can infer uh, the, the scattering coefficient. And here on the right plot, you can see some, some vertical profiles of the scattering coefficient as measured uh, during the mosaic expedition. And you see that there's quite some temporal variability, but there is also quite some uh, vertical variability in this scattering coefficient. So here we are starting to look into the vertical uh, changes of the properties. And let's come a little bit back uh, to our simple exponential models. And um, I want to give you a little bit deeper grasp about what we actually do when we take an, uh, an, an exponential model. So here is a typical easy formulation of an exponential model. So the, the light level at a certain depth is given by the light level at the surface. We subtract the albedo, so multiply with one minus albedo, and then it's an exponential over the geometric thickness with a, a bulk extinction coefficient. And if you look at that in a plot on the x-axis, you have the, the irradiance on y is, is the depth. And then this here would be the level that the light is at the surface. The surface we immediately reduce uh, the light level by one minus albedo. And then because we are in log space, we go uh, linearly down uh, to the ice bottom. Now that's not really the case. Uh, in nature, we actually have something that is reasonably smoothed. Also, we have some effects at the surface that are related to total internal reflection, making this profile actually going, going higher up uh, during parts uh, of this profile. So we need to be uh, super careful when, when using this, this easy models. To, to learn more about uh, these measurements uh, I've developed together with mostly with Mario, the, uh, the light chain, and this is based on the technology that you maybe all have heard of, that's digital thermistor chains that measure temperature throughout the ice. But we've replaced the temperature sensors for light sensors, and here you see it stretched along the railing of Odin, and each five centimeters we have a multispectral RGB uh, irradiance sensor. The chain is uh, two to three meters long, depending on configuration. We have 48 to uh, 64 sensors on this chain. And it's a fairly low cost approach. So one of these chains only costs you about uh, 2000 euros, plus obviously the, the recording equipment. So this was the first prototype was, was deployed in, in August 2018 at the, at the North Pole here, uh, together with a typical uh, TRIOS uh, transmittance setup. And here you can see the, the light chain standing right next to it. And I also have a picture from, uh, from underneath the water. So you can see here, there's three sensors still looking out in the water. It's just deployed in a little 
two inch hole uh, that refreezes easily and then data are transmitted back. So first, before uh, looking into the real data, we wanted to look a bit into what does it actually mean? Because if you have paid close attention, now here I did something that, that, that is a bit mean. I, we just took irradiant sensors and made them looking sideways. So the chain is actually measuring sideways irradiance. So we first needed to do some modeling to see what are we actually measuring with this. And here on the left uh, plot, you see now the vertical profiles as calculated by an accurate radiative transfer model uh, for in blue planar downwelling irradiance, sideward irradiance, and scalar irradiance. You see that the, and this is in log space. So you see that the, the planar downwelling irradiance, it's actually fairly closely following a, a linear uh, decay here. And in, in this part, you have some light loss uh, through the ice bottom leading to less. But this is much more pronounced for, for scalar irradiance, where here about half a meter away from the interface, you start losing photons uh, towards the ocean because of a lack of, of backscattering in the, in the ocean. And with the scatter, uh, with these calculations, we found out that actually the sideward irradiance is more or less equal or equivalent to, to scalar irradiance. There's only a constant factor between the two, but otherwise a sideward paint, pointing uh, irradi planar irradiance sensor is measuring scalar irradiance within a scattering medium. So that means that does this advance? Yeah, um, the sideward planar irradiance here is a total and the total scalar irradiance are proportional and that the four pi uh, total scalar irradiance is approximately four times the sideward planar irradiance. So this is very interesting uh, and really means that this light chain is actually measuring uh, total scalar irradiance and that's the light levels relevant uh, for algae. So the second generation of, uh, of these these chains we were able to deploy uh, during the Mosaic campaign. And here you can see again, the you can see now the vertical profile. So we have intensity on the right axis and uh, the depth on, on the Y axis. And here on the left side, you first see the data from the multi-urized coring site. And what you nicely see here that we have the, the two ice layers and they have uh, significantly different uh, absorption uh, properties in inside these different layers and then obviously in the water. Uh, contrary on the pure first year ice, uh, you see only one uh, regime of optical uh, properties in the ice. And with both of these stations, you see some funky changes going on in the surface as uh, the surface is, is changing. And then uh, later on in the season, that's now, you can actually start seeing here a few spikes appearing in, in this video. And this is algae that are growing on the chain. You see it on both sides uh, that are occluding some of the sensors. So we can see that there is some biology going on in these, uh, in these stations. What we also see here, for example, then on the, the multi-rise uh, side, we see how the surface is, is changing and, and decreasing so that this, this top second year ice part of the ice has almost melted away until uh, the sensor failed. In autumn, then we were able to, to deploy one of these light chains within a refreezing melt pond. And you see, this is a nice first year ice again, but we see here the influence of the melt pond to the top and we can follow it through how it, the light profile changes uh, during the freeze up. So this really helps us to constrain a bit more these vertical profiles in, in the ice. And the good thing is, as you see, we have here not only one measurement, but we have four different spectral channels. And uh, that's what I want to show you now. I look into the spectral channels. What we have in these plots, the color indicates basically the greenness of, of the light field. So it's the green value divided by the sum of the other uh, values. And the bottom panel shows the, the redness. The first uh, thing that we realize is you maybe don't see it, but I can assure you it's there. In this region, we see an, an increase in, of green color underneath the ice. And that's just uh, from, from mid-May to, to end of May. Uh, later on, as you can see, we see here this green algae appearing on, uh, on the sensors underneath the ice. And this is now from, from the L3 side. And 
You might remember that exactly here, this blue mark period is when uh, Polarstern was gone. So we know that there was something significant going on uh, in, in the biology uh, here while Polarstern was gone. We see, for example, here one event that is uh, likely related somehow to flushing or snow melt. I'm not 100% certain if this signal is physics or, or biology, but definitely we see on the webcam uh, that the surface uh, was changing here. What we also see later in, in the season here towards end of June when Polarstein came back, we see that these algae growing on our on our chain, they actually changed color. So this might either be a change in, in species or physiology of these, these algae, but it's also very interesting that this uh, tool can can tell us something about how the ecosystem changed uh, during the times that we weren't there. And with that, I am um, a little bit over time, but I uh, want to close with a summary. So optics can be very simple, but please don't oversimplify it and always make sure what, what assumptions you're taking. The complexity that you need to treat uh, optics is really dependent on what your goals are. If you want a rough estimate, you can work with super easy, simple exponential models, but just don't expect that they do, do good in more complex situations. Important, stay consistent with terminology, geometry, parameters, and this particular means no random crabs, grabs from the literature, please. So don't just take an extinction coefficient published in one story with a totally different model geometry and plug it into your model. Uh, don't just take a value that is also called mu uh, from some literature uh, and plug it into the what you need as a mu. There are uh, well-known cases of respected scientists that publish papers where uh, yeah, there is values grabbed totally randomly and for two different things that happen to have the same same letter abbreviation. And uh, be specific in your documentation. And with that, I'm finished. And thanks all for listening to me. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer.